This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Early. The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro. Translated by John Dryden. Book One. A Fateful Haven. Part Two. Thus Venus. Thus her son replied again, None of your sisters have we seen or heard, O virgin, or what other name you bear above that style. O more than mortal fair, your voice and mean celestial birth betray. If, as you seem, the daughter of the day, or one at least of chaste Diana's train, let not an humble suppliant sue in vain, but tell a stranger, Long in tempest tossed, what earth we tread, and who commands the coast. Then on your name shall wretched mortals call, and offered victims at your altars fall. I dare not, she replied, assume the name of goddess or celestial honors claim, for Tyrian virgins bows and quivers bear, and purple buskins o'er their ankles wear. No gentle youth in libyan lands you are a people rude in peace and rough in war the rising city which from far you see is carthage an Atyrian colony phoenician dido rules the growing state who fled from tyre to shun her brother's hate great were her wrongs her story full of fate which i will sum in short Sicaeus, known for wealth and brother to the Punic throne, possessed fair Dido's bed, and either heart at once was wounded with an equal dart. Her father gave her, yet a spotless maid. Pygmalion, then the Tyrian scepter swayed, one who condemned divine and human law. Then strife ensued, and cursed gold the court. The monarch, blinded by desire of wealth, With steel invades his brother's life by stealth, Before the sacred altar made him bleed, And long from her concealed the cruel deed. Some tale, some new pretense he daily coined To soothe his sister and delude her mind. At last, in dead of night, the ghost appears of her unhappy lord. The spectre stared, and with erected eyes his bloody bosom bears. The cruel altars and his fate he tells, and the dire secret of his house reveals. Then warns the widow with her household gods to seek a refuge in remote abodes. Last, to support her in so long a way, he shows her where his hidden treasure lay. Admonished thus, and seized with mortal fright, the queen provides companions of her flight. They meet, and all combine to leave the state who hate the tyrant, or who fear his hate. They seize a fleet, which ready rigged they find, nor is Pygmalion's treasure left behind, the vessels heavy laden put to sea. With prosperous winds a woman leads the way. I know not if by stress of weather driven, or was their fatal course disposed by heaven. At last they landed, where from far your eyes may view the turrets of new Carthage rise. There bought a space of ground, which, Brysa called from the bull's hide, they first enclosed and walled. But whence are you? What country claims your birth? What seek you, strangers, on our Libyan earth? To whom, with sorrow streaming from his eyes and deeply sighing, thus her son replied, Could you with patience hear, or I relate, O nymph, the tedious annals of our fate. 
Through such a train of woes, if I should run, The day would sooner than the tale be done. From ancient Troy, by force expelled, we came, If you by chance have heard the Trojan name, On various seas, by various tempests tossed, At length we landed on your Libyan coast. The good Aeneas I am called, A name, while fortune favored, not unknown to fame. My household gods, companions of my woes, With pious care I rescued from our foes. To fruitful Italy my course was bent, And from the king of heaven is my descent. With twice ten sails I crossed the Phrygian sea. Fate and my mother goddess led my way. Scarce seven the thin remainders of my fate From storms preserved within your harbor meet. Myself distressed, an exile and unknown, Debarred from Europe and from Asia thrown, In Libyan deserts wander thus alone. His tender parent could no longer bear, But interposing sought to soothe his care. Where you are, not unbeloved by heaven, Since on our friendly shore your ships are driven, Have courage, to the gods permit the rest, And to the queen expose your just request. Now take this earnest of success for more. Your scattered fleet is joined upon the shore, The winds are changed, your friends from danger free, or I renounce my skill in augury. Twelve swans behold in beauteous order move, And stoop with closing pinions from above, Whom late the bird of Jove had driven along, And though the clouds pursued the scattering throng, Now all united in a goodly team, They skim the ground and seek the quiet stream. As they, with joy returning, clap their wings, And ride the circuit of the skies in rings. Not otherwise your ships and every friend Already hold the port, or with swift sails descend. No more advice is needful, But pursue the path before you, and the town in view. Thus having said, she turned and made appear her neck refulgent and disheveled hair, which flowing from her shoulders reached the ground, and widely spread ambrosial scents around. In length of train descends her sweeping gown, and by her graceful walk the queen of love is known. The prince pursued the parting deity with words like these. Ah! Whither do you fly, unkind and cruel, To deceive your son, In borrowed shapes, and his embrace to shun? Never to bless my sight, but thus unknown, And still to speak in accents not your own. Against the goddess these complaints he made, But took the path, and her commands obeyed. They march obscure, for Venus kindly shrouds With mist their persons, and involves in clouds that, Thus in scene, their passage none might stay, Or force to tell the causes of their way. This part performed, the goddess flies sublime To visit Paphos and her native clime, Where garlands ever green and fair, With vows are offered and with solemn prayer. A hundred altars in her temple smoke, A thousand bleeding hearts her power. They climb the next ascent, and looking down now at a nearer distance view the town. The prince with wonder sees the stately towers, which late were huts and shepherds' homely bowers. The gates and streets, and hears from every part the noise and busy concourse of the mart. The toiling Tyrians on each other call to ply the labor some extend the wall, some build a citadel, the brawny throng, or dig or push unwieldy stones along. Some for their dwellings choose a spot of ground, which, first designed, with ditches they surround. Some laws ordain, 
and some attend the choice of holy senates and elect by voice here some design a mole while others there lay deep foundations for a theatre from marble quarries mighty columns hew for ornaments of scene and future view such is their toil and such their busy pains as exercise the bees in flowery plains when winter past and summer scarce begun invites them forth to labor in the sun some lead their youth abroad while some condense their liquid store and some in cells dispense some at the gate stand ready to receive the golden burden and their friends relieve all with united force combine to drive the lazy drones from the laborious hive with envy stung they view each other's deeds the fragrant work with diligence precedes thrice happy you whose walls already rise aeneas said and viewed with lifted eyes their lofty towers then entering at the gate concealed in clouds prodigious to relate he mixed unmarked among the busy throng borne by the tide and passed unseen along full in the centre of the town there stood thick set with trees a venerable wood the tyrians landed near this holy ground and digging here a prosperous omen found from under earth a courser's head they drew their growth and fortune to foreshew this fated sign their foundress juno gave of a soil fruitful and a people brave sidonian dido here with solemn state did juno's temple build and consecrate enriched with gift and with a golden shrine but more the goddess made the place divine on brazen steps the marble threshold rose and brazen plates the cedar beams enclose the rafters are with brazen coverings crowned the lofty doors on brazen hinges sound when first aeneas this place beheld revived his courage and his fear expelled for while expecting there the queen he raised his wondering eyes and round the temple gazed admired the fortune of the rising town the striving artists and their arts renowned he saw in order painted on the wall whatever did unhappy troy befall the wars that fame around the world had blown all to the life and every leader known there agamemnon priam here he spies and fierce achilles who both kings defies he stopped and weeping said o friend even here the monuments of trojan woes appear our known disaster fill even foreign lands see here where old unhappy priam stands even the mute walls relate the warrior's fame and trojan griefs the tyrian's pity claim he said his tears a ready passage find devouring what he saw so well designed and with an empty picture fed his mind for there he saw the fainting grecians yield and here the trembling trojans quit the field pursued by fierce achilles through the plain on his high chariot driving o'er the slain the tempts of rhesus next his grief renew by their white sails betrayed to nightly view and wakeful diomed whose cruel sword the sentry slew nor spared their slumbering lord then took the fiery steeds ere yet the food of troy they taste or drink the xanthian flood elsewhere he saw where troilius defied achilles and unequal combat tried then where boy disarmed with loosened reins was by his horses hurried o'er the plains hung by the neck and hair and dragged around with hostile spear yet sticking in his wound with tracks of blood inscribed the dusty ground meantime the trojan dames oppressed with woe to pallas fain in long procession go in hopes to reconcile their heavenly foe 
they weep, they beat their breasts, they rend their hair, and rich embroidered vests for presents bear. But the stern goddess stands unmoved with prayer. Thrice round the Trojan walls Achilles drew the corpse of Hector, whom in fight he slew. Here Priam sues, and there for sums of gold the lifeless body of his son is sold. So sad an object, and so well expressed, Drew sighs and groans from the grieved hero's breast. To see the figure of his lifeless friend, And his old sire his helpless hand extend, Himself he saw among the Grecian train, Mixed in the bloody battle on the plain, And swarthy Memnon in his arms he knew, His pompous ensigns and his Indian crew, Pencilia there, with haughty grace, Leads to the wars an Amazonian race. In their right hands a pointed dart they wield, The left forward sustains the lunar shield. Athwart her breast a golden belt she throws, Amid the press alone provokes a thousand foes, Dares her maiden arms to manly force oppose. Thus, while the Trojan prince employs his eyes, Fixed on the walls with wonder and surprise, The beauteous Dido, with a numerous train And pomp of gods, descends the sacred fane. Such on Eurotas' banks, or Synthus' height, Diana seems, and so she charms the sight. When in the dance the graceful goddess leads, The choir of nymphs and o'ertops their heads. Known by her quiver and her lofty mien, She walks majestic, and she looks their queen. Latona sees her shine above the rest, And feeds with secret joy her silent breast. Such Dido was, with such becoming state Amidst the crowd, she walks serenely great. Their labor to her future sway she speeds, And passing with a gracious glance proceeds, Then mounts the throne high placed before the shrine, In crowds around the swarming people join. She takes petitions and dispenses laws, Hears and determines every private cause, Their tasks in equal portions she divides, And, where unequal, there by lot decides. Another way, by chance, Aeneas bends his eyes, And unexpected sees his friend, Antheus, Sergestus grave, Cloanthus strong, And at their backs a mighty Trojan throng, Whom late the tempest on the billows tossed, And widely scattered on another coast. The prince, unseen, surprised with wonder stands, And longs with joyful haste to join their hands. But, doubtful of the wished event, he stays, And from the hollow cloud his friends survey, Impatient till they told their present state, And where they left their ships, and what their fate, Why they came, and what was their request. For these were sent, commissioned by the rest, To sue for leave to land the sickly men, and gain admission to the gracious queen. Entering with cries, they filled the holy fane, and thus with lowly voice, Ilionius began. O queen, indulged by favor of the gods to found an empire in these new abodes, to build a town with statutes to restrain the wild inhabitants beneath thy reign, we, wretched Trojans, Tossed on every shore from sea to sea, thy clemency implore. Forbid the fires our shipping to deface. Receive the unhappy fugitives to grace, and spare the remnant of a pious race. We come not with design of wasteful prey to drive the country, force the swains away. Nor such our strength, nor such is our desire. The vanquished dare not. To such thoughts aspire. A land there is, Hesperia named of old, The soil is fruitful, and the men are bold. Though Natrians held it once by common fame, Now called Italia from the leader's name. To that sweet region was our voyage bent, 
when winds and every warring element disturbed our course, and far from sight of land cast our torn vessels on the moving sand. The sea came on, the south with mighty roar, dispersed and dashed the rest upon the rocky shore. These few you see escape the storm, and fear, unless you interpose, a shipwreck here. What men, what monsters, what inhuman race, what laws, what barbarous customs of the place, shut up in a desert shore to drowning men, and drive us to the cruel seas again? If our hard fortune no compassion draws, nor hospitable rights, nor human laws, the gods are just, and will revenge our cause. Aeneas was our prince, a juster lord or nobler warrior never drew a sword. Observant of the right, religious of his word, if yet he lives and draws this vital air, nor we his friends of safety shall despair. Nor you, great queen, these officers repent, which he will equal and perhaps augment. We want not cities, nor Sicilian coasts, where King Ancestes Trojan lineage boasts. Permit our ships a shelter on your shores, refitted from your woods with planks and oars, that, if our prince be safe, we may renew our destined course and Italy pursue. But if, O best of men, the fates ordain that you art swallowed in the Libyan main, and if our young Iulius be no more, dismiss our navy, from your friendly shore, that we to good Ancestes may return, and with our friends our common losses mourn. Thus spoke Ilioneus, the Trojan crew, with cries and clamors his request renew. The modest queen a while with downcast eyes pondered the speech, then briefly thus replied, Trojans, dismiss your fears. My cruel fate, and doubts attending an unsettled state, force me to guard my coast from foreign foes. Who has not heard the story of your woes, the name and fortune of your native place, the fame and valor of the Phrygian race? We Tyrians are not so devoid of sense, nor so remote from Phoebus' influence. Whether to Latian shores your course is bent, or driven by tempests from your first intent, you seek the good Acestes government. Your men shall be received, your fleet repaired, and sail with ships to convoy for your god. Or would you stay and join your friendly powers to raise and to defend Tyrian towers? My wealth, my city, and myself are yours. And would to heaven the storm you felt Would bring on Carthaginian coasts Your wandering king. My people shall by my command Explore the ports and creeks Of every winding shore, And towns and wilds and shady woods In quest of so renowned And so desired a guest. Raised in his mind the Trojan hero stood And longed to break out from his ambient cloud. Achates found it, and thus urged his way. From whence, O oh, goddess born, this long delay? What more can you desire? Your welcome, sure, your fleet in safety, and your friends secure. One only wants, and him we saw in vain oppose the storm and swallowed in the main. Orantes in his fate our forfeit paid. The rest agrees with what your mother say. Scarce had he spoken when the cloud gave way. The mist flew upward and dissolved in day. The Trojan chief appeared in open sight, August in visage and serenely bright. His mother goddess, with her hands divine, Had formed his curling locks and made his temple shine and given his rolling eyes a sparkling grace, and breathed a youthful vigor on his face, like polished ivory, beauteous to behold, of Parian marble when encased in gold. Right. Thus radiant from the circling cloud he broke, and thus with manly modesty he spoke. He whom you seek am I, 
by tempest tossed and saved from shipwreck on your libyan coast presenting a gracious queen before your throne a prince that owes his life to you alone right fair majesty the refuge and redress of those whom fate pursues and wants oppress you who our pious offices employ to save the relics of abandoned troy receive the shipwrecked on your friendly shore with hospitable rites relieve the poor associate in your town a wandering train and strangers in your palace entertain what thanks can wretched fugitives return who scattered through the world in exile mourn the gods if gods to goodness are inclined if acts of mercy touch their heavenly mind and more than all that guards your generous heart conscious of worth requite its own desert in you this age is happy and this earth and parents more than mortal gave you birth while rolling rivers into seas shall run and round the space of heaven the radiant sun while trees the mountain tops with shade supply your honor name and praise shall never die Whate'er abode my fortune has assigned, Your image shall be present in my mind. Thus having said, he turned with pious haste, And joyful his expecting friends embraced. With his right hand, Ilionius was graced, Serestus with his left, Then to his breast, Cloanthus thus, And the noble Gaius pressed, And so by turns descended to the rest. The Tyrian queen stood fixed upon his face, Pleased with his motions, ravished with his grace, Admired his fortunes, more admired the man, Then recollected stood, and thus began. What fate, O goddess born, What angry powers have cast you shipwrecked On our barren shores? Are you the great Aeneas, known to fame, Who from celestial seed your lineage claimed? The same Aeneas whom fair Venus bore To famed Anchises on the Idaean shore, It calls unto my mind, though then a child, When Teusa came from Salamis exiled, And sought my father's aid to be restored. My father Belus then, with fire and sword, Invaded Cyprus, made the region bare, And conquering, finished the successful war. From him the Trojan seas I understood, The Grecian chiefs and your illustrious blood, Your foe himself the Dardan valor praised, And his own ancestry from Trojans raised. Enter, my noble guest, and you shall find, If not a costly welcome, yet a kind. I, for myself, like you, have been distressed, Till heaven afforded me this place of rest. Like you, an alien in in a land unknown, I learn to pity woes so like my own. She said, and to the palace led her guest, Then offered incense and proclaimed a feast. Nor yet less careful for her absent friends, Twice ten fat oxen to the ship she sends, Besides a hundred boars and a hundred lambs, With bleating cries attend their milky day and jars of generous wine and spacious bowls she gives cheer the sailors drooping souls now purple hangings clothe the palace walls and sumptuous feasts are made in splendid hall on tyrian carpets richly wrought they die with loads of massy plate the sideboards shine and antique vases all of gold embossed the gold himself inferior to the cost of curious work where on the sides were seen the fights and figures of illustrious men from their first founder to the present queen the good aeneas paternal care iulius absence could no longer bear dispatched achates to the ships in haste to give a glad relation of the past and fraught with precious gifts to bring the boy snatched from the ruins of unhappy troy a robe of tissue stiff with golden wire, and up a vest once Helen's rich attire, from Argos by the famed adulteress brought, 
with golden flowers and winding foliage wrought. Her mother led us present when she came to ruin Troy and set the world on flame. The scepter Priam's eldest daughter bore, her orient necklace and the crown she wore. Of double texture, glorious to behold, one order set with gems and one with gold. Instructed this, the wise Achates goes, and in his diligence his duty showed. But Venus, anxious for her son's affairs, new counsels tries, and new designs prepares that Cupid should assume the shape and face of sweet Ascanius, and the spightly grace, should bring presents in her nephew's stead, and in Eliza's veins the gentle poison shed. For much she feared the Tyrian's double tongue, and knew the town to Juno's care belonged. These thoughts by night her golden slumbers broke, and thus alarmed to winged love she spoke. My son, my strength, whose mighty power alone controls the thunderer on his awful throne, to thee thy much afflicted mother flies, and on thy succor and thy faith relies. Thou knowest, my son, how Jove's revengeful wife by force and fraud attempts thy brother's life, and often hast thou mourned with me his pain. Him Dido now with blandishment detains, But I suspect the town where Juno reigns. For this tis needful to prevent her art, And fire with love the proud Phoenician's heart, A love so violent, so strong, so sure, As neither age can change, nor art can cure. How this may be performed, and I'll take my mind. Ascanius, by his father is designed to come with presents laden from the port, to gratify the queen and gain the court. I mean to plunge the boy in pleasing sleep, and ravish in Italian bowers to keep upon high cithara, that the sweet deceit may pass unseen, and none prevent the cheat. Take thou his form and shape, I beg the grace, but only for a night's revolving space. Thyself, a boy, assume a boy's dissembled face, that when, amidst the fervor of the feast, the Tyrian hugs and fawns thee on her breast, and with sweet kisses in her arms constrain, thou mayest infuse thy venom in her veins. The god of love obeys, and sets aside his bow and quiver, and his plumy pride, he walks Julius in his mother's sight, and in the sweet resemblance takes delight. The goddess then to young Ascanius flies, and in a pleasing slumber seals his eye. Lull in, in her lap amidst a train of loves, she gently bears him to her blissful groves. Then, with a wreath of myrtle, crowns his head, and softly lays him in a flowery bed. Cupid, meantime, assumed his form and face, following Achates with a shorter pace, and brought the gifts. The queen already sate amid the Trojan lords in shining state. High on a golden bed, her princely guest was next her side. In order sate the rest. Then canisters with bread are heaped on high. The attendants water for their hands supply, and, having washed, with silken towels dry. Next, fifty handmaids in long order bore the senses, and with fumes the gods adore. Then youths, and virgins twice as many, join to place the dishes and to serve the wine. The Tyrian train, admitted to the feast, approach, and on the painted couches rest. All on the Trojans' gifts with wonder gaze, But view the beauteous boy with more amaze. His rosy-colored cheeks, his radiant eyes, His motions, voice, and shape, And all the gods disguise. Nor pass unpraised the vest and veil divine, Which wandering foliage and which flowers entertwine.
far above the rest the royal dame already doomed to love disastrous flame with eyes insatiate and tumultuous joy beholds the presence and admires the boy the guileful god about the hero long with children's play and false embraces hung then sought the queen she took him to her arms with greedy pleasure and devoured his charms unhappy dido little thought what guest how dire a god she drew so near her breast but he not mindless of his mother's prayer works in the pliant bosom of the fair, and molds her heart anew and blots her former care and dead is to the living love resigned and all aeneas enters in her mind now when the rage of hunger was appeased the meat removed and every guest was pleased the golden bowls with sparkling wine are crowned and through the palace cheerful cries resound from gilded roofs depending lamps display nocturnal beams that emulate the day a golden bowl that shone with gems divine the queen commanded to be crowned with wine that bowl that bellus used and all the tyrian lie then silence through the hall proclaimed as she spoke o hospitable jove we thus invoke with solemn rites thy sacred name and power bless to both nations this auspicious hour so may the trojan and the tyrian line in lasting concord from this day combine thou bacchus god of joys and friendly cheer and gracious juno both be present here and you my lords of tyre your vows address to heaven with mine to ratify the peace the goblet then she took with nectar crowned sprinkling the first libations on the ground then raised it to her mouth with sober grace then sipping off it to the next to place twas bitteous whom she called a thirsty soul he took the challenge and embraced the bowl with pleasure swilled the gold nor ceased to draw till he the bottom of the brimmer saw the goblet goes around iopus brought his golden lyre and sung what ancient atlas taught the various labors of the wandering moon and whence proceeds the eclipses of the sun the original of man and beast and whence the rain arise and fires their warmth dispense and fixed and erring stars dispose their influence what shakes the earth what cause delays the summer night and shortens winter days with peals of shouts the tyrians praise the song those peals are echoed by the trojan throng the unhappy queen with talk prolonged the night and drank large draughts of love with vast delight of priam much inquired of hector more then asked what arms the swarthy menon wore what troops he landed on the trojan shore the steeds of diomede varied the discourse and fierce achilles with his matchless force at length as faith and her ill stars required to hear the series of the war desired relate at large my godlike guest she said the grecian stratagems the town betrayed the fatal issue of so long a war your flight your wanderings and your woes declare for since on every sea on every coast your men have been distressed your navy tossed seven times the sun has either tropic viewed the winter banished and the spring renewed end of book one recording by joseph early falls church virginia